the, um, the quality analyzer, there's a program called Purify. There are others. And basically what it does is it hooks into the memory allocator. It hooks into, it analyzes the stack and it puts guard posts into the, into the memory and so forth so that it knows when, if you, out, if you reference a piece of memory that you didn't allocate, it'll catch you. That's an uninitialized memory read. If you go past the end of a, of a buffer that you allocated, it'll catch that. That's array boundaries, stuff like that. You just can't, you can't think of everything and you can't test these things automatically. So the, 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 this program is invaluable in that sense. Um, okay, then uh, like a coverage analyzer, what, what this is wonderful for is it basically, it, it, you run your tests and it will show you what parts of your program have been executed. So you go, oh, that's not being tested at all. If it hasn't been tested, it effectively does not exist. You cannot make any claims about what it does if it's not being tested. So, you know, as much as possible, you want, you want full coverage. Now, it can be really tricky to cover. I mean, for example, if you have code that deals with a, you know, um, a failure of the system, if new returns zero, which can happen in an embedded system, what are you going to do? Um, and if you have code that actually deals with that case, then, um, then, you know, that's good, but the new does not normally return zero. So you can't, you know, under normal circumstances, you can't test that. What some people have done in that case is they implement their own new or they use a macro and they, they just, they design it to fail every thousandth time and just to see if the system is robust. And then you can change the number from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, something like that. Could somebody get me some water? Thank you. Um, so that's what a coverage analyzer is. The um, performance analyzer is the same kind of a deal. It's asking you basically how fast, you know, okay, you, I got into function foo and I spent 10 minutes in there. That's, that's terrible, you know, and can we make that be faster? The, um, it's literally, you, you cannot inspect a program anymore and figure out whether it's going to be fast or slow. It's just too hard to predict where the, where the bottlenecks are going to be. You have to measure it through some external agent. Um, all right. So um, anyway, Emacs, debugger, and compiler, these are just basic tools of the trade. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, um, I use Emacs. I used to use Epsilon. Um, and I don't think there's really anything to say. Uh, Emacs is massive. It's extremely complicated. It was complicated when I was in college 20 years ago, and it hasn't gotten any simpler. Um, but it can really do almost anything. It integrates, it'll integrate with your version control. It'll integrate with your debugger. It'll integrate with your make system. And all of these things can, can boost your productivity. Um, all right. Uh, it's not too much. De debugging is like a whole nother talk. Um, but, uh, and I don't have any really good concrete advice to say other than uh, printf is not good enough. You really need to be able to walk through the code. You want to watch a piece of memory and watch it die, uh, stuff like that. And a good debugger will let you do that. Um, as far as compiler goes, um, one thing that is, is not necessarily apparent is the compiler comes and they all have this. They have, they have the ability to make diagnoses about your code. Um, so for example, Microsoft's compiler, you can set it to W4, which means warning level four. It's a very picky compiler. It finds a lot of problems. And literally, 19 times out of 20, it's a real problem that you want to fix. Every now and then, you'll find it being very pedantic about something that doesn't really matter and, or, the, or that is out of your control. But in general, um, cranking the warning levels, will, you'll just find quality issues in your code, stuff that you didn't miss. Um, or you know things that are hard to debug or that are unpredictable. Um, it's a huge way to go. Next. Okay, a little bit about um, estimates. The um, one of the things that you can do to really crank your professionalism is learning how to estimate how long something will take. Um, and I'd have to say that in my own career, this has been about the most difficult thing I've ever done. I'm just starting to get decent at it. Uh, doesn't mean that it'll take you 18 years. Uh, the first thing is just be pessimistic. Um, it's just going to take longer than you think. You have a lot of downtime. There's time where you can't work effectively, company meetings and colloquia, things you need to do. Got to play foosball. Um, so um, you don't really work 40 hours a week. So even if you said, well, it will probably take me 40 hours, if you're lucky, you might get 40 hours of work done in two weeks. Um, so you need to be able to measure that. The um, uh, bullet three, padding your estimates. This is pretty basic. You, you should be in the habit of doing this. Don't tell your manager and he won't, he won't, it's a sort of a don't ask, don't tell kind of a thing. But if you want to have time to do all the other things I'm telling you you ought to be doing, 
that doesn't come for free. That has to, you know, it needs to be done on a steady basis. Don't, you know, if a project manager says, oh yeah, we're going to rework all that code next release, it'll never happen. You just have to do it in the in the flow while you're going. Um, I'll just throw this out here. This is a trick I learned recently, but apparently it's a very old trick. If an engineer says, oh, I think it's going to take a week, um, what, uh, what some managers do is they multiply by two and they round up to the next time increment. <coughs> so if you say it's going to take a year, <laughs> it's gonna, it'll take like five years. So, um, and basically nobody ever finishes early. I've never, literally never, 99 times out of 100, heard of, heard of any milestone being met early, um, which tells you <laughs> that most milestones are missed. And if you want to, you know, if you want to be a, you know, top performing professional, if you get in the habit of hitting your milestones, if, um, pe people will love it. Next. This is my own, this is my own philosophy. This isn't even necessarily that of my managers, but basically, um, from a customer point of view, they don't like they don't like it when you miss a milestone because they've been depending on it. So the right thing to do is if you're, if you're in trouble, and almost all software projects are in trouble almost all the time, um, <laughs> is you need to be able to make trade-offs. Um, and the, the way to go is you, you, you have to prioritize. Pick the thing that's the most important. Do it first. Finish it. And then you've got something to show the customer. So even if, even if nothing else goes well, you can say, well, we implemented feature A. Do you want it? And the customer will invariably say, yes, send it along. Whereas if you say, well, we've got features A, B, C, D, and E sort of one quarter implemented. Would you like to take a look at it? Um, they, they're just going to laugh in your face. They're going to hate you. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, it, just from your own point of view, if you get in the habit of, um, of being reasonable with yourself about what you can get done, um, It'll make yourself happy. You'll avoid a lot of stress, and your manager will love you. The um, last last thing, again, this is not something that is officially espoused by my management, but um, you'll see that this is a sort of a backlash against this work all night <coughs> ethic that you've seen in the dot coms. Just work 40 hours. Work really hard. Don't play foosball. Go home. Rest. Go to a movie. Freshen your mind, and come back again tomorrow. You'll get more done, um, and you'll have a life. So. Um, so anyway, I, I won't say too much more about that. Everybody needs to make their own their, their own decision about how much they want to work. Some people really like work. I really like work too, but I don't work effectively if I work too much. So for my own productivity, it's better if I if I take time off. Go ahead. Okay, uh, trade offs. This is this slide is basically a way for me to poke a jab at Microsoft. The, um, the, the there's not much I can say other than the fact that customers' needs are in conflict. I mean, I, this happens every day. You've got two big customers, and they don't have the same concerns, and you don't know what to do. Um, all I can tell you is being aware of the issue is helpful. And don't think that you know the union of all the things that customers think they want is way out there. Um, and that's what you see with a big uh, piece of software like Microsoft Word. It's got 85 gazillion features. That nobody has the nerve to take any feature out. Um, it has two macro languages built into it. It's just insane. Uh, next, please. Um, a lot of times, the guys wearing the suits or the or the ladies um, are sort of scoffed at by the technical types. And <clears throat> I got to tell you, based on it's taken me years to get to this point of view, but. They really, the, the business people, they really matter. And the successful companies have really good business people, and the unsuccessful ones don't. The, the technology, I hate to say this, but it is actually almost secondary to what's going on on the business end. You know, if, so if you go to a company and they can actually operate their spreadsheet, and they actually have talked to their customers, and they, you know, they have some financial accountability, that company has an incredible leg up on the other one, no matter how brilliant the techni technical side of things is. The business stuff really matters. Um, and you also, unless you are if, if, you know, really in the habit of going off and finding customers yourself, that's what they do. That's what they're paid to do. If they don't do it, they should be fired. And you can be skeptical of their claims. But um, you know, that is their job, and you have to give them credit for that. OK, another, another one of my little maxims. Um, Basically, 
a lot of times the new guy gets to write the install script, okay? <laughs> but consider <laughs> that the install script is the first thing the customer sees. And if it doesn't work, the game is over. They're never going to get to that whizzy feature that you spent nine years implementing inside um, if the install script doesn't work. Um, there really, there are no bit parts. If I had my druthers and I was putting a team together, it would just, you know, you could easily imagine letting your most brilliant programmer do the make system and do the doing the install script because it's really important. Um, what happens is you'll see that a lot of times there's prima donnas who say that work is beneath me. Just don't work with people like that. Um, it's all the all the work that you know all the work that, that that is out there. It just needs to be done. Really, anybody can screw the schedule and trash the uh, trash the relationship with the customer. It's not not just the principles. Go ahead. All right, I um, I promised to do this, so I <laughs> this is the embarrassing part since I. Since my, my learning of computer science is sort of a, a little arbitrary, shall we say, uh, I thought you might be interested. I looked over your cu curriculum, and I haven't done nine out of the ten things that you've been studying. But I just thought I'd give you some encouragement that um, uh, here on the list, just to give you, I'll tell you a story about QSort as an example. The, um, you probably have studied all the ins and outs of shell sort, binary sort, and so on and so forth. Well, you'll, you'll never do this. You'll never implement a sort. Every, every runtime library has QSort. It's fast enough. It works fine. Um, um, <laughs> however, if you forget the QSort is unstable, you can be really sorry. The system that I'm working on right now is a um, linguistic tool for uh, segmenting text. Um, Japanese text has no spaces in it. And or Chinese text. And so you have to write some kind of a probabilistic system that says, I think that the segments are probably at you know, points A, B, and C. And then you score that system. Um, and um, the way I was doing it is I was kicking all these theories off. I think you guys did a little in dynamic programming. Is that right? OK, so it's a pruning system. And you have to sort the scores, right? So what, what happened is I was getting different results on different platforms because QSort is unstable. So the, the two scores were functionally equivalent, but they didn't, produce the, you know, the, they didn't produce the same segment. I'm going, what is happening here? How could this be? So anyway, that was a day down the drain. Um, so a lot of times, what you know about the algorithm or the, uh, the phenomenon will really come in handy going, going forward. I mean, your technical background is just outstanding if you've managed to stay awake through the whole year. Um, <laughs> you have. You have no worries whatsoever on the technical side. Um, the, um, anyway, so stuff that I get to use, I'm writing you know, pretty much production systems. They have to be fast. It's a lot of emphasis on computational efficiency. So um, stuff like hash tables you'll use all the time if you're doing production code. Um, I got to use finite state automata uh, and transducers. Uh, one of the things I'd say about almost any of this stuff is, again, it is it, a lot of times it's fairly easy to understand the things in theory, but if you have to write code that doesn't leak memory that actually does these things, it's a whole nother matter. Um, and a lot of times, you know, even with something as basic as a you know as a grammar or a finite state automata, there are good and bad ways to do it. Um, so keep an eye on that. Uh, go ahead next. Okay, I. Um, I put together a list of resources. I will I will send the URL for my website out. So, um, the, probably the last thing I want to say is there's some awesome books that are coming out in the last few years. Um, and being in the habit of reading these books, I know you guys don't possibly have time to read another word uh, than you than you have to right now because this curriculum is so challenging. Um, but um, um, I'll just mention a couple of these things up front. The uh, extreme programming uh, is by an author named Kent Beck. And he's basically the father of the extreme programming movement. Um, and I, th I think this is, I really think this is basically going to be the way that we write, ultimately, we write software. Uh, there's probably a few kinks in the system. One of their beliefs is that all software should be created by pairs of people, one person typing and one person sort of taking a meta view. My coworkers <laughs> could never do that. Um, <laughs> It's it, it's it's really you know not a, that's that's just not going to fly in in every environment. Um, but that having been said, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Um, anyway, that's a very good book. Uh, one book I left off of here is a book called Writing Solid Code. It's a pretty old book. It's about ten years old. It talks a lot about um, about basic things. It's just the craft of computer programming. <clears throat> You're going to spend a lot of time writing code and. 
um, getting good at it and sort of you know getting making it look nice. Having the code look nice is surprisingly important. Um, if it looks nice, a lot of times it is nice. And uh, if it doesn't look nice, you can't tell whether it's good code or not. Um, so you know, coding for legibility and understandability is important. Um, one of the main book, page down a little bit. The main book uh, in the refactoring movement is written by a guy named Martin Fowler. If you keep your eyes open, you're going to hear the same names over and over again: Steve McConnell, Kent Beck, Martin Fowler, Scott Myers. They're, you know, uh, the um, that's pretty important. If you're doing C++, the effective C++ uh, is a must. C++ is a disaster, by the way. It um, Nobody, as far as I can tell, nobody has ever implemented it properly. The compiler manufacturers say, it's just too hard. We cannot implement the standard, and nobody needs this feature anyway. Um, the software that I work on is highly portable. It runs on basically every flavor of Unix, plus Windows and the Mac. And you can't use anything. You, so we end up actually implementing a lot of stuff from scratch, because we can't even use the standard template library, which is not portable. Um, and if the standard template library is not portable, nothing is portable. It's, it's, so it's, it's terrible. Anyway, so that means you end up implementing a lot of stuff yourself from scratch, and then you want to have Scott Myers' book if you're doing C++. Java is better behaved than C++. It's newer, so it doesn't have quite as many warts, but it has its own set of problems. I've never bought into the art and science debate in the computer science field. I don't really think it's a science, and I don't really think it's an art. I treat it like a craft. Um, you'll have to draw your own conclusions when, when and if you go to uh, work in the field, but um, this uh, this book has a lot of really good stuff about habits and things that you can do, and a lot of it's a lot of it's very directed stuff that you know stuff I can't go into uh, in a short amount of time. Design patterns uh, is the last one I really want to talk about. Um, you did object-oriented programming already. Did you talk about this at all? Um, the pattern movement basically is suggesting that. <coughs> the same problems come up over and over again. So an example is you have an object-oriented system. That's great. And that object-oriented system is going to model, let's say, a physical, it has physical, physical components that it's modeling, like a printer. So you have this problem. There's only one printer. How do you stop somebody from implementing three classes for the same, for the same object? They, that shouldn't be allowed to happen. There's a pattern called the singleton pattern that describes when these things come up what and when you would use it. And you don't, it, what's nice about it is it's pure object oriented. You, you can use it if you're using Java or C or Python or um, Smalltalk. A lot of the real hardcore object oriented people use Smalltalk, which I didn't even mention. Um, uh, Philip Greenspun's book is excellent. Did you, I don't know if you got to read it yet. Um, okay. Um, he, <laughs> I won't say anything bad about Phil. He's quite a character. Um, um, anyway, but his book is terrific. And you can, it's actually a lot of it's on the web. And I go back and I look at it all the time. Even though I haven't implemented um, any high-end web systems, um, I think what he has to say about that is right. This one more book that I just recommend. You can, I'm not even going to talk about it. It's a very good book on statistics. Um, you probably have good books uh, already for that. Um, that was the material I wanted to get through. I'll be happy to answer any questions, um, tell you more about stuff, you know, projects that I've worked on or anything that is, um, um, that you would find helpful. What is the language thing again now? What language? No, what is the language thing? Oh, okay. Uh, we are, my company's doing a, uh, we basically do um, computational linguistics um, for, uh, our customers are typically companies like Google or Yahoo or AOL. They're high-end search engines, and they want to get into Japan. And they don't have the specific Japanese or Chinese knowledge or the data, because a lot of these programs are very data intensive. Um, so what we do is we're selling morphological analysis tools. Um, so, um, so just by way of example, when you do something like this in Japanese, this means Nihonjin, Japanese person. Well, that's nice. And then, you know, there could be other things that follow that. It so happens, that's a word, 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 and so is that. And this is very, very typical. So you have to have some kind of a plan. In this case, it's easy. If you see this, you know it's, it's um, the, I mean, the default strategy is to do what's known as longest match. Um, but um, that doesn't really cut it. You'll see, then you have things like, in Japanese, um, 
This is called particle no, and it's 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 endemic in the language. Does anyone here speak Japanese? Okay. Um, so um, you have something like this, and this is extremely short and extremely common, and it is it has a high chance of confounding almost any strategy <laughs> that you adopt. Um, so um, anyway, so the system that we sell does a statistical analysis based on dictionaries and uh, <coughs> training data of where the most likely um, boundaries occur. And then we will also give you sort of back off uh, things. If you're doing information retrieval, a lot of times you don't really care. If you have all the plausible ones, um, that's fine. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's what we do. We also do language identification uh, software. We do encoding software. There's a whole problem of <coughs> legacy encodings out in the world. It's really scary stuff that we have, some stuff we haven't even dealt with, but um, that um, there are, you know, there are ISO standards that are impossible to implement. Um, there are all kinds of code encoding issues. Microsoft, is, as is common, implemented its own version of the most important uh, Japanese encoding standards, stuff like that. So basically, you know, our customers want, will come to us because we are the clearinghouse for knowledge Asian. Um, so anyway, that's what we work on now. Um, Pro Do you yeah? speak both Japanese and Chinese? I, uh, no, I actually don't work on the Chinese product, and my Japanese is actually not that great, but I studied it for two years at Harvard Extension, and I learned enough that I can now read the linguistics textbooks and, and learn, learn the ins and outs of it. It's not ideal, um, but um, it's a kind of a tricky thing because we have to write <coughs> software that's highly portable, has to be very fast, and linguistically significant. And so you have to kind of hit the sweet spot in terms of, um, of all of those things. Um, plus, we're, we're self-funded, so we, don't have, we can't put huge teams of people <laughs> on, on the effort. Uh, prior to working at Basis, I, worked, I was at Dragon Systems, and uh, we did a speech recognition product called Dragon Naturally Speaking. Has anyone seen that yet? Yes. Okay. Um, Anyway, so I was uh, basically the first engineer hired to work on that. I worked with a guy named Joel Gould, who's a very good friend of mine. Um, and the way that we did that was um, Dragon was already in the speech business, and such as it is. And the way, basically what happened there is they had, they had a DLL that could do speech recognition. It had no user interface not a spoken user interface or a visual interface, and it was 20 times too slow, and uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't have any, it had a whole bunch of problems, like it couldn't, you couldn't add a word to the system, you couldn't remove, delete a word from the system. So basically, our project was to go from here to something that actually worked, that solved people's problems. Um, and so what, so the, you know, the trick is I don't even I don't really even know how this worked, and this this, this was really hardcore computer science down here. It's uh, stuff you're going to talk about later on, like Markov processes and things like that, uh, hidden Markov models. That that's what they were doing there. Um, but so from the, so we were applications engineers. What we had to do is basically implement all the features. We had to implement a, a whole dictionary subsystem so that users could add their name to the system. People have like to be able to type their name. Um, and we had to have a way to correct errors. Uh, <coughs> system made mistakes all the time, so you don't want it, if it made the same mistake over and over again, it's useless. So it's not as bad as if it makes different mistakes, or e ideally it learns and it gets better and better. Um, anyway, so that's what we did. I worked on that for about five years. Um, and um, it was really fun. It was a very, uh, it's is the largest project I ever worked on, and it was, it was really quite compelling. Um, plus, it was, you know, not only was it neat, but it actually was something that people needed, especially people who have uh, any kind of repetitive stress injury. Um, anyway, so that's, that's, that's what I did prior to that. I also managed that group and <coughs> led this huge project. Um, it's about 50 people, uh, which was a total headache. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, but now I'm back to being an in individual engineer. Yes? You mentioned that a lot of um, projects are kind of middleware, just bolting legacy yep. systems together and so on. How would you go about just putting together hu two huge systems? Which, you know, well, I think the first thing you want to do is you need to be able to characterize what it is that system A and system B actually do. <coughs> so you really want to do something like this, where you've got system A here, and you say, given these inputs, 
I get these outputs. If you can't do that, you know, it doesn't matter what the salespeople say the system can do. You have to see this for yourself, all right? Um, so then, then you say, well, okay, I know I'm over here and a cust my customer's over here and wants to be over here. What's the fastest way to get there? And you have, always have this buy, make decision. Um, and lately there's a lot more um, buying than making, but now happily there is the third choice of downloading from freshmeat.net. Um, and don't discount that. that. That really can be the way to go. You have to watch out for the GPL. Um, but, um, or not, according to Stallman. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so um, probably number one is you have to be able to characterize what it is that the system does. And then you need to be able to <clears throat> you know, really say, I own this. There's no mystery here as to what the heck is going on. So, and, and the other thing is that what almost always happens you know, is that this interface presents a socket, let's say, and this guy over here looks like this. And you're like, well, shit, what am I going to do? Um, so the design patterns talks about this, and there's a, there's a pattern called adapter. <clears throat> and what you do is you literally make an object or a set of objects that <clears throat> encapsulates what it is that you want to do. So let's say that object A has 850 different capabilities, 30 of which are interesting to you you can export the 30 things that you want, skip the rest of it. Doesn't matter if it doesn't work. You won't see it. Um, and then, you, you know, so you sort of are controlling it. So this is a really good way to go in terms of uh, with objects or encapsulation. You can really just hide, you know, you can hide the system. Um, the, you, you know, it, it doesn't sound that interesting if you're bolting two systems together. Don't think about it that way. Think about this. There's a guy here who wants to be here, and he's willing to pay money to get there. And if you're smart enough to, you know, figure out a cost-effective way to get there, and you can maintain it, then you've solved his problem, and you have made enough money to eat dinner. Any other questions? Yes? You talked a bit about, the, like, the clash between tech and business. Yeah. It sounds like you have a kind of come to a different view now. But I'm just curious if you've been in a, an environment where you've actually seen a nice sense of cooperation between the two, two groups or what your observations have been. Um, it, it, there's an inherent conflict. And it, 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 it is very frequently, I mean, what happens is that the business guy tells the technical people something they don't want to hear or there's a lack of respect. The lack of respect when you can deal with right up front. <clears throat> that just shouldn't happen. If you're in an environment where you feel like you can't respect your, your coworkers, something's got to give. Okay, you can all go to mediation or you can quit. Um, so so um, you, we can skip that one right off the bat. Um, beyond that, the, um, the probably the best environment that I've had, I, I, I'll just do, I'll give you two examples. Um, number one is when we did Dragon Naturally Speaking, all right? <clears throat> we, we, it was starting to work. We had it up to the point where we could do 500, it was a 500 word recognizer and in real time. So you could say any, anything that was in vocabulary, 500 words, it would recognize 96% accurate, something like that, 95% accurate. So the research guys were like, well, we loaded in a, um, we, lo we loaded in uh, a, um, a bunch of kids' stories. And so if you, if you tell a kid's story in your own words, it'll understand you. And we did some fairy tales, too. The business guy comes in and says, I can't show that at Comdex. You're going to tell me I'm going to be demoing fairy tales to a bunch of business people? They won't believe it. They won't take it seriously. He said, start over. Do it with business letters. OK. <laughs> now, see, that's good. He, made it, he prevented us from looking like idiots. Um, so, you know, at some level, I mean, that's what a business guy can do. He can just say, that doesn't make sense. We know, you all know, there is no functional difference between a fairy tale and a business letter. <laughs> um, um, so, um, but, <clears throat> and then to go on, we, the, the time leading up to the launch was extremely compelling. We were... We, were, we had heard rumors that IBM was coming out with a similar product, and we had to beat them to market. We were a you know, self-funded, tiny little company. We had to beat them to market. In March, there were well-placed analysts who were saying continuous speech recognition is never going to happen, or if it does, it'll be five to ten years down the road. And we had it in-house, ready to go. It was rolling out in like four weeks. 
So the marketing people, we had to work, they worked really hard in terms of, you know, keeping a lid on it. And then they, they worked towards this product launch. You know, a lot of this stuff you say, oh, product launch, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It does. Um, we, you know, we rolled it out in New York City on April 2nd. Don't roll your product out on April 1st. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, we, it just turned out that Richard Dreyfus was a real speech recognition buff, and he was interested in us, so he was our MC. He did it for free. Another thing that small companies have to do is they get a lot of free work <coughs> uh, about what they're paying me here. Uh, and uh, it, it, the, the launch went flawlessly. Everything worked. We got tons and tons of press. We kicked ass at all the trade shows. The whole first year was just awesome. And that was all the business people. I mean, the technical side of things, you know, we had done a lot of work and, you know, you couldn't have it. You couldn't, you needed both. Um, the, biz, the business people needed to, you know, they, they drummed up the publicity. They made it exciting. It was a compelling product and it might have done well without it, but it really, you know, took us over the top. Uh, just another example, my current job, my, the first boss that I had when I came to BASIS, she's now on maternity leave, um, was a woman who just, she had sales in the brain. I mean, she, she could just sell, okay? And it's not that we're selling snake oil, but there is a, there's something about it. You know, you call the customer and then they have a question, you answer them right away. Don't wait. You know, in dot-com land, people could run out of money at any moment. If you can close the contract and get paid before they run out of money, that's good. Um, and she did that um, over and over again. She, you know, she, she, the other thing that she did is we were, you know, the, the market for these morphological analyzers is pretty small, okay? And we, um, I mean, do you want one? I'll, I'll sell you one for $100,000. Um, um, so, you know, she just looked at it and we were charging, you know, we had been charging $10,000, $15,000 for them. <clears throat> she just raised the price and she discovered that the demand was inelastic. It just, no matter what the price was, there were certain people who, <clears throat> who had to have it. So that's a business thing. I can't do that. I can't tell you what the price of the software should be. So at that level, that, I mean, that's when it's working. When it's not working is when the business people tell you things that aren't true. They haven't talked to the customer. Um, or, you know, salespeople, who, you know, the classic thing you'll see in Dilbert every week is the salesperson who sells something that doesn't exist. Um, that does happen, and you have to watch for that. But... Um, um, it doesn't have to be like that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I told, I told Kanit that um, when you guys graduate and if you want, you know, in the months leading up to it, if you want any advice about placement or, you know, good places or bad places to work, I'll be more than happy to help. I'm, I'm a big networker. I'm always trying to, you know, help people out and to, you know, give them uh, contacts and so on and so forth. And I'll send Kanit the uh, URL for this if you want it, um, and then she can pass it around. So if you want to go back and check out any of these books, um, if you click through and you buy it through my website, my school gets a dollar. So um, <laughs> um, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you.